Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with slow cooker beef pot roast. That's right, I got so many requests for slow cooker recipes, I finally went and found and dusted off my slow cooker, and we're gonna use it to make a beautiful beef pot roast. So here we go. So what we're gonna use here is what's called a seven bone chuck roast. All right, you see that bone kind of makes the shape of a seven? That's where it gets its name. All right, if you turn it upside down, you have what they call an L roast. All right, I just made that part up. So once you get your seven bone roast, you're gonna go ahead and season both sides very generously with salt and pepper. All right, looks like a lot, but that's a big thick piece of meat. All right, so season generously. Then I want you to coat both sides with white flour. Okay, just regular all-purpose flour. I want you to sprinkle it on and I want you to pat it into that meat really well. Okay, in the industry, this is known as spanking in the flour. And there's no way I would just make up a term like that to, you know, make you sound ridiculous in front of a chef one day. It's just not my style. All right, so you're going to spank in the flour till it's well coated, shake off the excess. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sear this meat really well on both sides. I'm going to put a large, large skillet on medium high heat with a couple tablespoons of vegetable oil. And when the oil starts to shimmer and it's hot, we're going to go ahead and sear that on both sides. Now you want a really nice brown crust on this. So there's two ways you can tell. The second best way is look for the blood, the juice coming up to the surface, or just look underneath, that's the best way. If it's brown, turn it over. Now just because we're gonna use a slow cooker to cook this meat doesn't mean everything's just gonna get thrown into the pot. In fact, those slow cooker recipes where you just add everything to the crock pot and turn it on, those are not good. Those are more, what's the word for it? Stupid because you gotta still use the proper techniques, like browning the meat and caramelizing some of the vegetables, etc. And you see here, I have some quality, quality crustification. All right, so once my meat was very, very well seared on both sides, I removed that to a plate. I'm gonna turn it down to medium, and I'm gonna add some thickly sliced mushrooms and a chunk of butter. All right, so I'm gonna start sauteing those. Again, I'm on medium heat here. I gave them about a three or four minute head start. When they just started to brown lightly, I went ahead and I threw in a roughly chopped onion. Okay, this is gonna cook so long. Do not be worried about precision cutting. All right, just whack that thing up. So I'm gonna cook the mushrooms and the onions for about five minutes more until the onions start to turn translucent. All right, you definitely want some color on the edges of those mushrooms and onions. That's gonna help give the sauce a nice deep color. I'm gonna throw in a couple cloves of chopped garlic, give that another minute. All right, when it gets to that point, I'm gonna throw in a nice big tablespoon of flour, and that's gonna help thicken that gravy later. All right, stir that in, cook that for about a minute, and we're almost done here. I'm gonna go ahead and add about a tablespoon of tomato paste. I'm gonna caramelize that a little bit, just in the center of the pan, just for like a minute. All right, and at that point, we're gonna add our stock. Now, I use chicken broth. I know a lot of people use beef broth for this. I really think it comes out better with chicken. You're gonna get so much beef flavor from that giant hunk of beef we're gonna braise here that you don't really need it. So I like the lighter flavor profile of the chicken broth, up to you. All right, I'm gonna stir that in. As soon as that comes back to a simmer, it's gonna thicken up and then just turn it off. All right, so that's looking good. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna place some celery and some carrots in the bottom of my crock pot. I'm gonna lay my gigantic seven bone roast on top. And yes, it's a very tight fit, but that's okay. That's gonna sort of shrink up and collapse as it cooks. So as long as you can get the lid on, you're okay. I'm gonna throw in some fresh herb. I have some rosemary and some thyme. I'm gonna dump over my onion and mushroom mixture, kind of poke everything down. And then the easy part, put on the lid, lock it down, put it on high, and you're talking about five or six hours. Okay, basically you want it to be fork tender. All right, so this was me after about two hours. It was starting to kind of shrink up a little bit. A little bit of juice, liquid was coming out of the vegetables. All right, so check it every few hours, poke it down a little bit. Eventually it's gonna look like this. You're gonna have fat pooling up at the top, always, just like if we're braising this on the stove. You wanna go ahead and skim off any fat that comes up. You can do that continually throughout the cooking. Eventually the bones are gonna release and you can pull out the bones with your tongs and that will give you more room, all right? And eventually it's gonna be completely falling off the bone and fork tender and you are pretty much done. You can try, but you really can't screw up a pot roast in a slow cooker. As long as you let it cook long enough, you're good to go. 
All right, now some people pull out the meat like this in these big chunks and they try to slice it. Why would you bother? Just break off hunks of meat and serve that. Just grab a couple chunks, throw it on some mashed potatoes, ladle over that amazing gravy and those braising vegetables, celery, onions, carrots, those mushrooms. And by the way, I believe I've trained you to the point where you know you needed to taste that sauce and adjust for salt and pepper, right? It probably needs another pinch or two of salt. Maybe a grind of pepper. All right, maybe even a shake of cayenne. You know how we like it. Maybe you'll brighten it up a little bit with some chopped fresh parsley, optional. And there we go, a beautiful seven bone beef pot roast. So delicious. You know that song by George Thurgood, Bad to the Bone? This is the opposite of that song. So I hope you give it a try. It's really, really nice way to use a slow cooker. Anyway, you can head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more information as usual. And as always, enjoy. Apple Cider Braised Pork Roast. And actually, that's kind of false advertising because I'm not using apple cider. I'm using apple juice, but both work in this recipe. So either one. We're also going to do a beautiful, beautiful reduction sauce. No ruse, no thickeners, just natural goodness. So here we go. I have a boneless pork shoulder roast. This one's about four and a half pounds, which is, I think, a perfect size for this recipe. We're going to season that pretty generously on both sides with salt and pepper. I'm going to take a large skillet on high heat with a little bit of vegetable oil, and we're going to sear that on all sides. You want to get a pretty decent brown crust on there. Once you've browned your piece of pork thoroughly, I'm going to transfer that into our slow cooker. I'm going to turn the heat down to medium and I'm going to add some sliced shallots and diced celery. Now you can certainly use onion here, but I had some shallots. So I thought for a change of pace, I would go with the shallots. I'm simply going to cook those in whatever fats left in the pan just for a couple minutes. We're just giving them a head start. This is all going to braise for a long time. So after two or three minutes, I'm going to pour in apple cider vinegar and deglaze the pan. We want to make sure we get all those brown bits off the bottom. That's all, you know, free flavor. And we're going to cook that until the apple cider vinegar is just about gone. See that? It's almost evaporated. At that point, you want to scrape the entire contents of the pan into the slow cooker. All right, I'm also going to toss in four or five cloves of peeled garlic. You don't need to slice it. You don't need to chop it. You can just throw them in whole, just like that. I'm going to throw in a bay leaf. And then finally, we're going to finish this with a couple cups of apple cider or, in my case, apple juice. They both work really well. So we're going to pop on the lid. I'm going to set my slow cooker to low, and we're going to let that braise for about six hours approximately until basically fork tender. Now, every couple hours, I want you to turn it over. This is not a braised dish that has a lot of liquid. So that liquid's only coming up about a third of the way up the pork roast. So every couple hours, I want you to turn it. And it's cooking nice and gently, nice and slowly. All right, not much can go wrong here. But you do want to turn it every couple hours. Now, we're not making pulled pork. I don't want this to fall apart. I want to be able to slice this like a pork roast. So I do want it to go until it's tender, but I don't necessarily want it falling apart. So you're going to have to be the judge. You're going to have to be the boss of your pork roast. See right there, mine was almost ready. It was just about where I wanted it, but I thought to myself, you know what, give it another half hour and it'll be perfect. Now, if you're new to this cooking thing and you're a little nervous, we don't blame you. Relax though. Air on the side of a little too long versus not long enough. All right, once I've determined the pork is done to my liking, I'm gonna remove that to a plate, cover it with foil to keep it warm because our sauce is gonna take about 10, 15 minutes to put together, which is fine. That big hunk of meat is gonna stay plenty warm. All right, while the pork rests, we're going to transfer the cooking liquids, the braising liquid, into a saucepan. I'm going to put that on high heat, bring it up to a boil, and simply reduce it down to about approximately 25% of its volume. When it starts getting down low, you want to keep an eye on it. When mine reduced down to that far, I'm going to turn off the heat and finish the sauce. And you know what? I just realized I haven't made any jokes during this video. And you know why? because I do not find apple juice humorous, not at all. I'm gonna add some black pepper, some cayenne, a pinch of salt. All right, final touches, I'm gonna whisk in a spoon of Dijon mustard, and you don't have to use Dijon here, you can use the yellow mustard if you want, but don't. 
And then we're gonna finish with a few chunks of cold butter, which are basically gonna thicken up the sauce a little bit, give it a beautiful, beautiful texture, a lovely shine. And once the butter goes in, make sure you keep whisking, keep whisking, keep whisking until the butter disappears and you're done. And yes, I have to admit something right now. When you weren't looking, I strained this because I wanted it to look pretty in the pictures. At home, you don't have to strain it. All right, I'm gonna finish with a little fresher, I'm using Italian parsley. A little bit of fresh sage would be very lovely. All right, I'm gonna give it a taste. Do any final seasoning adjustments. Maybe a little more salt, maybe a little more pepper. Depends, you decide. And then, I think you know what to do next. Slice your pork, put it on a hot plate, spoon over some of that sauce. Remember, this is a highly reduced, very flavorful sauce. You don't need a lot, okay? So just a few tablespoons is all you're gonna need. Even without the sauce, this pork is delicious because it's slowly braised in that flavorful liquid. But when you put this sauce on, it just goes up to a whole nother level. And if you did everything properly, you do not need a knife. This will literally be fork tender. And that was really, really delicious. And here you go. I know you guys love when I do the second bite and this really did deserve it. Just so luscious and the epitome of homey, cold weather cooking. So I really hope you give that a try. All the ingredients are on foodwishes.com, of course. And as always, enjoy. Homemade ketchup. That's right, this takes a long time to make. It's not that much cheaper, but at least when you're done, you will not like the flavor as much as the store-bought brand. All right, so I wanna be clear that I'm only doing this because we got so many food wishes for it, not because I think it's a good idea. You are completely crazy to make your own homemade ketchup. So on that note, let's get started. So we're gonna need two cans of ground tomatoes, also known as crushed tomato. A lot of homemade ketchup recipes call for tomato paste, but I never like how those taste. So we're gonna go old school and just start with crushed tomatoes and cook them down to sort of our own tomato paste. And by the way, we're gonna use a slow cooker for this process. It's gonna take a long time, but it's gonna take some of the labor factor out of it. We're gonna go ahead and rinse each of those cans out with about a quarter cup of water. So after the tomato product and a little bit of water, we need some sweetener. And in our case, we're gonna use just plain white sugar. Of course, most of your store-bought brands are using corn syrup or even worse, high fructose corn syrup. So I guess that would be one of the advantages of making it at home. So we're gonna dump in our sugar. Of course, to balance the sugar, we're gonna need some vinegar and we're just gonna use regular white distilled vinegar. So I'm gonna pour that in. Obviously, all these measurements are critical and they'll all be on food wishes, of course. All right, after that, we're gonna go ahead and add some onion powder and some garlic powder. We're gonna add some plain table salt, a little touch of celery salt, a little touch of dry mustard, a little bit of very finely ground black pepper, and one single clove. That's it, just one. In fact, I took that little berry off the top, that little bud. I want just a little bit of clove in there. All right, we're gonna give that a stir. And as I was stirring, I was like, oh my God, you forgot cayenne. What are you doing? So a little bit of cayenne. And then basically the entire rest of the recipe is you putting your slow cooker on high and cooking it uncovered for a really long time until it reduces down by almost half and becomes very, very thick. Now you can definitely do this on the stove top, but you'd have to stand there stirring like forever because it could burn to the bottom. And in a slow cooker, even though it's gonna take like 10 or 12 hours, which is basically how long mine took, you still don't really have to worry about it scorching and burning as long as you're giving it a stir every hour or so. So to me, that's just easier and safer. Okay, so every once in a while, just give it a stir and monitor it. And like I said, it's gonna take a really long time. And you'll actually notice in this shot here, the lights look totally different. That's because it's almost dark and I had to turn my kitchen lights on. So at this point I was pretty much done, but I ran out of daylight and I didn't wanna finish filming in the dark. So I decided to just put it away for the evening. I thought to myself, you can catch up in the morning. But anyway, the next morning I brought it back up to temperature and then to finish, we're simply gonna put this through a fine strainer, but to make that a little easier, I like to give it a little blending with the stick blender, with the immersion blender. I guess you could do that with the raw tomato product, but I always feel like it works better at the end because it's thicker. So I'm gonna give that a quick blending. At that point, we're gonna ladle that into a fine strainer and then simply use the back of a ladle to push the mixture against the screen and it will trap any skins or seeds or whatever in the strainer. There you go. All right, so most of it will go through. The rest of that you're gonna discard. Don't forget to scrape the bottom. There'll be lots of ketchup under there. At that point, I'm gonna transfer it into a bowl that's easier to shoot. 
and then we're going to let it cool completely before the final step, which is tasting it. You want to taste this cold because that's how you're going to serve it. And as far as spices and salt go, things taste different hot and cold. So wait till it cools down. Give it a taste. I decided to go with a little more cayenne, a little more pepper, a little more salt. And of course, I'm using a clean spoon to stir that in. And if I want to taste it again, I'll drip from the clean spoon to the spoon I already tasted on. And that's how you prevent cross-contamination. Not that that's a big deal, but still. And once that's seasoned, you're ready to serve that up. May I suggest french fries? Those work nicely. So we give this a taste. Really good, although I feel like I'm forgetting something. There we go. Just need a little adult beverage. And all kidding aside, that really was delicious. Very, very, very similar to those popular supermarket brands. One of them rhymes with rhymes. Just a little bit of a brighter flavor, a little more tomato-y of a flavor. But very, very close, very similar. And was it worth it? Hell no. Like I said, you got to be crazy to make your own ketchup. So while I don't think anyone should ever try to make this, I did want to show you because so many people requested it. So to the craziest members of our audience who, despite my jokes, despite my warnings, will still attempt to make this. I'd like to say to those few brave souls, I love you guys. All right. So I really do secretly hope you give this a try. Although on the record, don't do it. It's crazy. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the top secret recipe ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy! Apple butter! That's right, have you ever been eating applesauce and thought to yourself, this is good, but I wish it was like a thousand times better? Well, my friends, that is a very good way to describe apple butter. And there's more good news. The technique for making this stuff is very, very easy. Except please don't confuse easy with fast. Okay, while well, super, super simple, this takes many, 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 many hours. But the results are so well worth it, as hopefully you're going to find out. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And first up, we're going to cut up about five pounds of apples. And my favorite variety for this would be Granny Smith. But any classic cooking apple will work. And what we'll do before we start cutting is go ahead and take out the core. Which, if you have one of these cores, is pretty easy. Since all you got to do is sort of plunge that down through the middle. And then once that core has been removed, with hopefully all the seeds, we will simply cut this into quarters. And then you could, if you want, just start slicing these, but I like to give them one more cut, and then slice them into about one inch pieces. All right, so that's one way you can do these. But let's say for the sake of argument, you don't have an apple core. You could also do it this way. Okay, we'll make one cut straight down next to the core, right about where you think the seeds would start. And then once that first slice is taken off, we'll set it down on the flat side. And then we'll make another cut straight down, again close but not too close to the core. And then we'll simply do that two more times. And while you will lose a little more apple than the first method, it is still a pretty fast and effective way to do this. And you may remember this technique from such videos as Ben Franklin Breakfast Bowl. Oh, and as you may have noticed, we did not peel these. So that's going to save us a bunch of time. But that's not the only reason. I also think this comes out tasting better and looking better and feeling better since it's going to actually get thicker if we don't peel them. So if you've been peeling apples all your life for apple butter, I'm sorry. But you really did waste all that time. But hey, now you know. And then what we're going to do once we have our five pounds of apples prepped is go ahead and transfer them into whatever we're going to cook this in, which could be a roasting pan for the oven, or a heavy bottom stock pot for the stovetop, or as in my case, into a large slow cooker, which I think is by far the best and easiest method. And once those have been transferred in, we'll go ahead and add the rest of the ingredients which will include a little touch of white sugar, just a mere cup and a half, as well as a half a cup of brown sugar. And I know that looks like a lot, but it's roughly half of what most people use, in case that makes you feel any better. And then to that, we're also going to need a little bit of salt, as well as, of course, some cinnamon. And then we'll finish up with some freshly grated nutmeg, which I took the liberty of freshly grating earlier. And then last but not least for our spices, we'll do a little pinch of allspice, which apparently tastes like all the spices put together. And then in a little plot twist, for some acidity, we're going to do some apple cider vinegar. Okay, a lot of people like to use lemon juice in this, but personally, I think the cider vinegar works out better. And then we'll finish up with a splash of cold fresh water. And that's it. We'll go ahead and take a spoon and give this a mix. And once all that's been stirred together, it is now ready to cook and cook and cook for a really, really, really long time. And if we are using a slow cooker, what I like to do is start it covered on the highest setting until it starts giving up its liquid and starts getting a little bit soupy. 
which is going to take a little while. I mean, it's called a slow cooker for a reason. So even on the higher setting, this did take a good while to get to this point. And then what we'll do once this mixture does come up to temperature and start to soften up and get nice and juicy is turn it down to the lower setting and let it cook uncovered for many, 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 many hours. And exactly how many is going to depend on your slow cooker and other variables. But as usual, we're not going to go by time. We are going to go by appearance. But anyway, what we want to do is cook this on low for as long as it takes until it looks like this. At which point I'm going to grab an immersion blender and blend this smooth which really is quite a simple step if you have one of these stick blenders. But if you don't, don't worry. You can just transfer it into a blender and then transfer it back. Of course, being very careful, it's hot. All right, we never want you burning yourself, especially if you're gonna blame me. And we do wanna get this pretty smooth, but we are gonna pass this through a strainer later, or at least I am, you do what you want. But like I said, I do wanna puree this pretty smooth. And that's it, we're still not even close to being done. Since once pureed, we're gonna continue cooking this uncovered on low until it reduces even further and gets thicker and darker and even more intensely delicious. And other than stirring it once in a while, there's really nothing to do except wait and wait and wait some more. Okay, so the only way to screw this up is impatience. Let it cook, let it cook, let it cook until it's at least as thick and dark as this. And then what we'll do once we've determined it's cooked long enough is go ahead and pass that through a fine mesh strainer. And while this step is technically optional, it's only gonna take a couple minutes. And since you just spent like 10 hours getting up to this point, that doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But anyway, you decide. I mean, you are after all the John Sutter of your apple butter that's not really a butter. Raise your hand if you're disappointed there's no butter in this. I know, me too. But it's fine, don't worry. We're gonna put butter on whatever we put this on first. But anyway, we'll go ahead and pass that through a strainer, at which point we can go ahead and transfer that into whatever we're gonna store it in. And please note, you're not gonna be able to see the final appearance until it's fully cooled. Okay, that color is going to deepen and it's going to thicken up. And hopefully once fully cooled, it should look something like this, which I think is just absolutely gorgeous. And at this point, it's ready to serve on so many things, All right? Maybe a cheese biscuit or a piece of butter toast, or in my case, English muffin. But no matter what you serve this on, prepare to be blown away by its intense apple-y flavor. All right, you know those sticky brown juices that sort of bubble out of an apple pie? That is this in a spread form. All right, when you make a batch of this, it's basically like being able to have apple pie anytime you want. And by the way, if you stopped watching this video because you don't have a slow cooker, you shouldn't have. Because in the blog post, I'm going to tell you how you can do this without one. But anyway, that's it. How I do apple butter. It's always been a little shocking that applesauce is so popular in stores. But you almost never see this stuff. I mean, who knows? Maybe it's too flavorful and they're afraid people can't handle it. But anyway, thanks to this video, it doesn't matter. Because now you have the technology to make your own. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Slow cooker red curry beef pot roast. That's right. What happens when you cross Southeast Asia and Midwest America? This happens. And this was incredibly delicious. So if you're someone that enjoys your comfort food on the exotic side, this is perfect for you. So here's what we did. First, we found a three pound piece of old beef. And I mean that literally. I found this hunk of meat in the half off section in the meat department. And that stuff's generally there because of color, not because of taste or quality. The outside turns from red to gray and they can't really sell it. So they have to mark it down. And I took advantage of that and it was perfect for this. So you can read more about my old meat on the blog post. But what we're going to do is we're going to season that with salt and pepper on both sides. And we're going to brown it on high heat and just a few teaspoons of vegetable oil. You want to get a really nice sear on that because there's nothing sadder than putting an unbrowned piece of meat into a slow cooker. So we're not going to do that. So once it's well browned, you're going to turn off the heat, remove it from the pan. We're going to place that in our slow cooker on a bed of chopped onions. And all that means is place it on top of a chopped onion. We just call it a bed because, you know, it sounds more comfortable. At that point, we're going to go back to our hot pan. The heat's off, but the pan's still hot. So I'm going to throw in a nice big spoon of red curry paste. All right, nothing fancy right off the supermarket shelf. I'm also going to add some cumin and some coriander. And all we're going to do with the back of our spoon is just rub that spice mix into the hot oil just to wake it up a little bit. Technically, that's an optional step, but it does make me feel better. At that point, we're going to add a couple cups of chicken stock. All right, we're going to put our heat back on high. I'm also going to stir in a can of coconut milk. Love that stuff. All right, the exposure setting on the camera doesn't like it. 
but it is a wonderful product. So I'm going to give that a stir. I'm also going to toss in a can of diced tomatoes. I'm using the one that has the roasted green chilies in it. Very nice for this. We're also going to pour in some Asian fish sauce. Very critical ingredient. That's going to give the cooking liquid its saltiness and even more important, its funkiness. And then we need a little brown sugar for sweetness to balance the saltiness and the funkiness. All right. I'm going to add a whole bunch of minced garlic. I'm going to add a spoon of tomato paste. And then some sliced ginger. I just peeled and sliced the root. And I just do it in big enough pieces you can pull out later. You could also grate it or mince it. Up to you. And then last but not least, a little bit of fresh lime juice. And I'm not dirtying any strainer. Just squeeze it through your fingers and you'll catch all the seeds. And yes, we are working under the assumption that you do wash your hands thoroughly before you start cooking. You do, right? Good. So a little bit of fresh lime juice. We're going to give that a stir. And as soon as this comes up to a boil... We're going to carefully pour it over our pot roast. I'm also going to pop in a couple bay leaves, give that a little stir, and then we're going to cover that, and then we're going to let that slow cooker do its thing. All right, I'm going to do mine on low, which is going to take you maybe seven or eight hours to get this fork tender. You could also do it a little quicker on high, and we'll talk more about that on the blog post. But bottom line, you're going to let it braise in that slow cooker until the meat is fork tender. And I suggest using a fork to test it. So if you can stick the fork in with a minimum amount of effort, it's ready. And at that point, I'm going to remove my meat from the broth. All right, just the meat. Leave the other stuff in there. Because what we're going to do to finish this is braise some greens and cook some potatoes in this broth. It's going to be amazing. And at this point, if you want to skim a little of that fat off the top, hey, check it out. There I am. Hey, how you doing? All right, you can take a ladle and skim a little of that off. Although in many parts of the world, you could get arrested for this. Because traditionally, curries like this, the fat is left to float on the top. It's considered a very important flavor component. All right, but we're going to skim a little off. So we're going to go ahead and prep our veggies. I have some little new potatoes I just cut in half. If you're working with big potatoes, just cut them in chunks. And then for a little greenage, we're going to use some baby bok choy, which are very easy to prep. Just cut off a little of the bottom. Slice the stock parts into like two-inch sections. And you can actually leave the leaves whole like that. All right, very simple. Once the veggies of your choice are prepped, go ahead and dump them into your broth. Poke it down. There should be just enough liquid to make it look like that. If you got to add a splash of water, go ahead. We're going to cover that. I'm going to turn that on to high. And I'm going to cook that until the potatoes are tender. How long is that going to take? I have no idea. But it doesn't matter. You're going to test them with a knife. And when they are tender, we're going to thicken this up just ever so slightly with a teaspoon of cornstarch that we're going to dissolve. And like a tablespoon of cold water, we're going to go ahead and stir that in. And I don't want this to be a thick gravy, but I do want that broth to thicken ever so slightly, just like one degree. All right, just to take it from watery to something that's a little closer to a sauce. All right, so stir that in. And then the last step here, I like to cut my meat into large chunks. Just makes it easy to serve. It also makes it quicker to heat through. So this is kind of turning into a stew, but that's okay. Everyone likes stew. So we're going to dump that in. I'm going to cover that and let that go for about 10 or 15 minutes. And as soon as that meat's heated through and that broth thickens up just ever so slightly, we're ready to taste and serve. So this really is a simple recipe. Sure, it takes a while, but you know what they say. You don't want to hurry a curry. But anyway, we're going to stick a spoon in there. We're going to taste it for seasoning. And if you're happy with it, dish it up. Look at that. You can already tell it's going to be awesome. And then to make this slightly even more awesome, we're going to top it with some crunchy roasted peanuts. Just chop them up and a healthy dose of fresh cilantro, and that truly is an amazing bowl of food. I think it's just a really great technique for pot roast, and like you saw, a great way to use up a less than perfect piece of meat. And by the way, pro tip, you probably don't want to mention to your dining guests that you got the meat for half price. Sounds a little sketchy. But anyway, notwithstanding our suspect meat, this really did taste wonderful. That meat is just melt in your mouth tender. The potatoes soak up that rich, spicy, aromatic broth. And you can see there what I was talking about, about the cornstarch. That little bit doesn't really thicken it into a gravy. It just gives it a little extra body, which makes the broth extra nice. Just beautiful. So anyway, here's what you should do. Figure out where your slow cooker is, find it, dust it off, and give this great red curry beef pot roast recipe a try. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.